really appreciate you taking the time. And the last time I spoke with you, I'm going to guess it was like two and a half, three years ago. And when that happened, it was kind of like, yeah, NFL guy, yeah, he does music. Okay. Uh, I don't think that Narada would have worked with a legit artist if you were just a novelty thing. So I'm impressed by how much you've grown in just, you know, two, three years. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. Uh, how really did you wind up working with him? Did you know his credits and you reached out to his team? No, he, um, we actually had the same publicist at the time. And um, I guess somehow he heard my music through the publicist and he's like, I got to work with this guy. So. And now he's the drummer in Journey. Yeah, I was the drummer in Journey. <laughs> exactly. So you've got this great EP. It's an EP, right? You know, anything less than nine songs is kind of an EP. Uh, right. When did you actually finish that? I know it's the year. year. Uh, the year prior. I, re I recorded it. I recorded that EP during, um, I started it during camp. We had like an off day or a couple off days in a row. So I flew out there for a day and then I finished it uh, during the bye week. <laughs> yeah, and I finished it during the bye week. So I recorded it that previous season. And um, wow. Yeah. A bye week. Wow. So when you're making the music, do your teammates think this is the weirdest guy on earth for doing music that's this great and doing it in his off time? Or do you have people going, man, I wish I could do that too? Um, I don't know. I don't. Well, first of all, I'm not playing anymore. I retired. Um, yeah. Um, I don't know how much you know about me from a mental standpoint, but I'm not really, because of the way that I am, I've never really been. Okay, I'll just say I hated playing football. Um, <laughs> Thank you. I hated it. I, uh, the only reason I got into football was because of – I got kicked out of this engineering camp when I was in high school. I needed something to do over the summer. Um, so I started playing football to, you know, hopefully get in shape and that kind of thing. Obviously, I was good at it. Um, but I never really felt connected when it came to, like, you know, being a team or a family. I guess I look at everything too logically. And logically, we're beating the shit out of each other just so we can be ready to go beat the shit out of somebody else. I don't – family doesn't do that. But um, – Right. Uh, so there were a lot of different – there were a lot of disconnects between me and um, NFL players, so much so, in fact, that it scared teams away from drafting me. So um, – and I just get that out of the way at the beginning of the interview because I know, like, when we met two and a half years ago, there were a lot of things that I know about myself now I don't, I didn't know then. Um, sure. So I like to get that kind of stuff out of the way now because I don't, you know, like, I don't want to, like, make weird faces or something like that if, like, you know. So, so um, but that being said, I did share it with a couple of people. And a couple of people I shared it with, I mean, I can name the people, um, Ray Sean Jenkins. Mm -hmm. Isaac Rochelle, Joey Bosa, those three people. Um, and those are probably really the only people that I actually let, you know, into my music. But I'm glad that I did because it gave me the confidence to, you know, release it to everybody because they dug it. So, so I would say, yeah. yeah I, I, and I would say as far as that is concerned, you got Rayshon and Isaac. That's like, man, that's really cool. Um, that's really weird that you would, choose your off time to do this, but that's really cool. Um, right. And Joey, I think he's going to start playing piano when he's done. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if he got into music when he was done with football. Yeah, I love interviewing former NFL players because I get to find out about themselves and what they're going to do the rest of their lives now that they've hopefully built a foundation. Like when I was speaking to Kyle Turley, who also has done music I don't quite think he's at the Joe Boxing level, but, you know, he's done music in, in an interesting way. He's done metal and country and all that. And he kind of goes, honestly, I didn't love football. Uh, it's great to be out of football. But you get to see what all these smart and interesting people are doing like yourself. So you've really built this unique path 
that hasn't been done before. Like I can't think of an NFL crossover musician at your level yet. Yeah, Terry Bradshaw had a couple singles, but we're only listening because, hey, that's the guy who won a couple Super Bowls. You, right. you're a real musician, <laughs> but didn't I read that you started playing guitar because your coach was telling you that it'd be a good anger management thing? My, uh, so, um, uh, sorry, I'm trying to figure out how to approach that story. Uh, <laughs> Whenever yeah, you don't yeah. want to talk about something, you know, Darren, the next topic. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I can talk about whatever. I just, um, from a mental health standpoint, I like to think about everything before I say it. Because, well, just from a human being standpoint, you see a lot of people, especially people with mental health issues that just go off and say shit. And then after they say it, it's like, oh, well, I've got a mental illness. That's not an excuse. Right. Um, so for me, I like to, you know, think it out a little bit. But I would say when I started playing football when I was 16, there was this coach that saw something in me that I still don't know how the hell he saw it because I was 16, didn't know what the fuck I was doing. I didn't know anything about football. <laughs> Uh, his name was Charleston Fobbs. He pretty much became my dad. Um, neither of my parents or anybody in my family are really in my life anymore. I had a very bad childhood. Um, but anyway, um, this guy was, you know, one of the first people in a long time. I mean, stepping on the football field was one of the first times that I felt like I deserved to be alive. People were happy to see me, that kind of thing. Um, and he... You know, like I said, he saw something. He told my dad that he could get me into college. He ended up turning me into a parade All-American in two years. Um, you know, he was he was everything, and he he died during that season. Um, two thousand is either thirteen or fourteen, mm -hmm. but uh, and you know, that's one of the reasons why. Like, even when I think back to football, I you know. I mean, I went to practice the day that I found out my dad died. I had a game that's, that Sunday. I found out, like, on Thursday. You know, I, I mean, I am thankful that it happened during the season because I was able to focus on football, kind of, um, and continue to play. But when it was over, you know, I mean, I was on suicide watch and all that other kind of stuff. So Jeff Fisher, who was the head coach at the time, you know, kind of talked to me at the end of the season um, and said, you know, you need to find something to do during the off season, you can't just sit at home. Right. I deserve to be able to sit at home. I just beat the shit out of myself for, I don't know how many weeks. We didn't go to the playoffs, we're not winning. So I did it for nothing. I deserve to be able to sit and do nothing, you know? And he's like, yeah, but that's not a good place to be in. You know, not in the mental state you're in, that kind of thing. He said, uh, have you ever thought about playing guitar? Um, I said, no, <laughs> you know, like, I mean, I played saxophone when I was younger, but yeah, I had never thought about it. I didn't, at this time, I didn't know who Jimi Hendrix was, any of that. Like, I didn't even know, wow. what, like, what a Fender Strat was. I didn't know what in the, I didn't know how to play guitar or anything. So I'm like, yeah, sure. Uh, I guess I'll try it out. And, like, for the first time, I would say when I first played it, it was just cool. You know, you start a new instrument. But when I really started to understand it, it was – it was the first time that I felt like I could really communicate with people and they understand me. Mm -hmm. So it started out as a hobby, but, but it became like a voice. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, that's sorry. But that's how I got into playing guitar. So did you start on a Fender Strat as your first instrument? No, it wasn't. A, it was a Fender acoustic, but it wasn't a Strat. And yeah. It takes a lot of work to get an endorsement, per se, but do you have a particular brand or model that you favor for your guitars? Um, I love Fender Stratocasters. I mean, I, sure. when I look, sure. I mean, I'm looking at the rest of my guitars right now, but I got three custom shop Fender Strats. They're pretty much prototypes. Like, when I get a signature guitar, this is what they'll be. They're 69s. Um, they all got different paint jobs, but this one... Yeah. Um, this, you know, black and white one. But I've got like a blue one. That's uh, the Clapton style right there. Yeah. But this this is my baby right now. It's a, Fender, it's a 69 Fender Strat like the other yeah. one. Uh, it's got a chamber body, chamber mahogany body. John Cruz made it. He made all three of these. Um, but yeah, I love these guitars. If you can't tell. Uh, I find that people are kind of in three 
or four different camps with the guitars. They either like the classic Fender Strat, they like mm-hmm. the Gibson Les Paul, and that's probably because they grew up on Led Zeppelin. They like the Gibson SG because they grew up on ACDC. Or they go with the more metal kind of guitars like the Jacksons and, you know, the BC Warlocks and all that. Do you have yeah. all kinds of guitars or is it just Fender Strats primarily? I got, um, I got three Strats. I actually just got this cool Jazzmaster in the mail from Fender uh, yeah. Yeah, a week ago. Um, so I got a Jazzmaster. I got a bass, a uh, P bass. I play yep. bass too on my, you know, on my stuff. Um, I've got a Les Paul. I've got a Martin acoustic and I've got a Fender Acoustasonic uh, Stratocaster. That's a serious collection there. Nobody buys a Martin if they're not serious about guitar. So you just said something that blew my mind that I didn't realize, that you didn't know who Jimi Hendrix was eight yeah. years ago, something like that. So who was the first guitarist that you listened to and went, wow, that's kind of what I want to do? Jimi Hendrix. Okay. So you heard yeah. Hendrix as the first guy. And then... <laughs> Who did it go from there that you really began following besides Hendrix? I would say my um, I was, I mean, obviously, you know, uh, being from Detroit, Michigan, having grandparents from the South, I was obviously really acquainted with like the blues scene. Uh, mm-hmm. So blues mm-hmm. music, as well as like gospel music and so forth. No one in particular, but, you know, guitars featured in both of those. Um, and I was just, so I said like Muddy Waters, Howlin' Wolf, you know, were the first couple of guys. I kind of, Chuck Berry. Um, and Hendrix was kind of, because that's what happened. I was listening to these cats and I'm going to play their music and it's super easy and it's all the same, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm really big into uh, research. So I'm like, well, what came after this? And that's how I found Hendrix. And that was, uh, that was one of the greatest days of my life. Like. <laughs> <laughs> well, you just mentioned Detroit and doing your research. Did that ever lead you to MC5? You said it one more time? Did that ever lead you to looking into the group, the MC5 from Detroit? No. I mean, Jack White went to my high school, and I didn't know that until after I found out who Jimi Hendrix was. So I would say, like, if, as far as growing up in Detroit, that's more of a – I'm really familiar with all the Motown, the soul, that kind of stuff. Um, Marvin Gaye is my hero. Detroit is kind of the greatest music city that people don't really connect. Like Alice Cooper is from there, the MC5, the White Stripes, Kid Rock, Eminem, you know, even if you want to talk about the insane clown posse and all that. But yeah, I think it's the greatest music city there is. And did you ever get so serious about music that you started to learn the names of all the session musicians and the people who played on all the big records? No, and that's because I think differently. Um, I mean, for example, like, you know, people see, you know, I don't know, different fans do different things. For me, I'm trying to absorb and regurgitate. So as opposed to, like, being in awe of who's playing, I actually want to hear what they're playing and pick that up, if that makes any sense. It does. Then there's the nerds like me that go, well, it's Motown. It's a bass player. That means it's James Jamerson. And you want to hear everything that the guy ever did. You know, that makes sense. I'm just a different level of music nerd on that note. So uh, like everyone else, you're kind of quarantined and holed up and life is on hold. But have you been writing or recording lately? Oh, yeah. Life's not on hold. Um... For me, my main goal this year was honestly to establish myself as a legitimate musician by having a catalog by the end of the year. Mm-hmm. That plan's still on track. You know, I got an album coming out in September and another one coming out in December, along with one that came out earlier. I was able to, the one that came out earlier, I actually, I actually produced like the first week of lockdown. Like I put it together. It did not exist before Corona. And I made that during the first week of lockdown. Since then, I've probably put together about 350, 400 different tracks. Songs. Three fifty? Um, did you just say? Mm-hmm. How? <laughs> just, I mean, it's really easy. Um, you just get in touch with a feeling or something, and you know, you get a rhythm going, and you play. You know, you get you you just you just create. I mean, how do you write articles? You know, you just you just That's do it. True, but. I yeah. write uh, 14 articles a, in a week, and people think I'm insane for writing 14 in a week. I'm not writing 350 
beats or tracks or anything like that. That's a different level. <laughs> we, we all have different things that we're good at because there's, I mean, as impressive as that is, there are, you know, there are things that I'm really bad at, you know. So, I, you know, we, we all got different things that we're really good at. Totally. So, totally. so you got this catalog going in the album in September. Did you work with Narada again or did you promote it, uh, produce it yourself? Um, the album, no, the album that's coming out in September was produced by Alan Phillips. He played, uh, Alan's done a lot. Like he's won an Emmy, that kind of thing. He played in Fatburger. That was probably like the most notable group that he played in, but obviously he does like TV show compositions, all those kind of things. But he's, he's the one that produced, uh, Moonbeam, Black Magic, and he'll produce, he's produced the rest of that album that's coming out. Um, and then there's a different producer for the album that's coming out in December. Wait, full-length album in September, full-length album in December. Did I hear you correctly? I mean, you could call it a full-length. I mean, it's 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 got an album title, but like it's an EP. It's an EP list. The way I see it is like I don't want to. I don't want to bombard people with my music with every release. Um, I would like to give people a chance to want more before I just start giving them more. So I, I mean, I, I think these two albums together are probably like. 11, 12, maybe 13 songs. Yeah, nothing crazy. Got it. I, I'm very impressed with all that, to say the least. And it makes me think, if you didn't have this outlet uh, to put out all this creative thought and, and content and all that, what would you be doing with your time besides being a great parent? Probably still be playing football. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, just from the standpoint of like, you know, you need something to do. I mean, the reality of the situation is, you know, I knew what I was walking away from mm -hmm. when it came to like retiring to do the music full time. And I'll just say without trying to sound too cocky or arrogant, I plan on football, me with football being like the rock with wrestling. Like, oh, he used to wrestle? Yeah, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, so. I I do plan on traveling and touring the world and being like a global artist and being known as one of the best to ever do it. So no XL for you bringing up the rock and all. <laughs> <laughs> nah. <laughs> yeah. Well, well. Speaking of wrestling, actually, so I I'd like to ask people who used to play in the NFL: Is uh, the NFL Retired Players Association or whatever the group is called does uh, offer some things to players like DIY, uh, Diamond Dallas Pages yoga program. Have you ever tried that? I have not. I have heard about it, but I have not tried, <laughs> I have not tried it. I'm more of a yin yoga person. Um, when it comes to, like, the NFLPA, I'm not going to say it's a joke because that would be mean. But I'm sure you know. You've interviewed enough former football players to know, like, it's – you know, it's a bunch of guys that aren't getting paid anymore that need a job, and they're just doing enough to justify getting a check. It's the worst union I've ever seen in my life. So. <laughs> yeah, you don't hear a lot of positive things said by Terry Crews about his time in the NFL, to put it very nicely. I can dig that. But I'm <laughs> talking specifically about the PA, like the yeah. Players Association. Yeah. But, yeah, I mean, it's – the NFL is what you think it is. It's just we tell ourselves it's something different, you know? Same way with UFC. It's what you think it is. You just tell yourself it's something different. Like, yes, that person's on the ground unconscious. Yes, that's blood all over the canvas. Like, these things happen. It's a brutal sport, you know? So, yeah, I mean, I, I think people inside, you know, they know. But, you know, I, I don't know. I, I also believe in, like, Equivalent exchange, you can't get, you can't make something out of nothing, you know? So mm -hmm. everything comes with a price. But, but you made it out. Uh, and you're one of those people who, how do I put this? A lot of people, the thing that they'd hang up their big life accomplishment on is that they played in the NFL seven or eight years. And every, is it eight years before I forget? Eight okay. Years. Every time, like, somebody introduces a person like you, they go, oh, did you meet Joe? Yeah, he played in the NFL for eight years. But you're not hanging your hat on that. As you said, you know, oh, The Rock also wrestled, that kind of thing. And yeah. you're pushing the ball forward so that your life did not peak. 
based on playing in the NFL. I don't know how many people that you're going to hear say that or kind of push that way. Is there a person besides The Rock who you look at and go, that's how I want to do it in terms of having this diversified, multifaceted life outside of football? Um, I would say I would honestly be the first one to do what you're talking about. Just from a standpoint of, I hate when people introduce me as this is Joe, he used to play in the NFL. Like, does that mean that I wouldn't be a part of this conversation if I didn't? Like, you know, um, even when, like, I, I don't even know if you noticed, like I cringed when you just said it hypothetically. Like, I don't, I don't like talking about sports. Um, I feel like, I don't, I feel like it's a waste of time. Well, like, let, let, let me say this, like, as a New Yorker, and you have to go to cocktail parties or press events, of course, pre-COVID, and people give you that stupid elevator pitch in 15 seconds or less. Hey, this is Mike. He used to blank, 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 and that's what you hear. And but we're the other country that does that. <laughs> yeah. I mean – like, if I'm meeting you in public or whatever, like, if I bump into you at Whole Foods and you introduce yourself, like, I want to know who you are. I want to know your hopes and dreams. What do you worry about? What keeps you up at night? Like, I don't care what you do for a living because you do it for a living. I'm sure you're not trying to talk about it now, you know. I mean, that's – that's I, I don't like small talk. Um, I Yeah. I actually recently found out that, I, um, that I'm on the autism spectrum. So, like, the small talk thing, you know, the, the time-wasting thing, all those kind of things. Like, I don't, I, don't like, I don't like human interaction, and I really don't like human interaction when it comes from the States. For that reason, like, we're all, you know, it's like, hey, this is so-and-so, and this is his reason for living. Like, no, you know, like, a job's just a job, and it's nothing more. And I think we need to stop defining ourselves by what we do and start to remember is who we are. Hmm. It seems to me like everything you do, you, you do well. Before you said you, there are certain things you don't do well, but when you set your mind to something, you're going to be at the best of it, and you might burn out on it, but you're going to be as great as humanly possible and not slack. Still not make a Pro Bowl, but yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> hey, Pro Bowl is overrated if special teams players can make it. Who you know what? <laughs> Everyone, I remember Mike Pouncey, every Pro Bowl player that has said that to me, Pro Bowls are overrated. Well, you wouldn't know. You've been. Like, <laughs> you know, like if Drake came off the stage. Grammy's overrated. What? No. Like, you know. But you got to go to Hawaii at some point anyway, right? I've never been to Hawaii. Well, if you go to Hawaii, uh, that's good enough, right? Is that the main part of the, the Pro Bowl? That's true. I think, yeah. I mean, I – the Pro Bowl thing and all that other kind of stuff, I know that's part of, like, deep-seated emotional trauma, you know, me trying to prove that I belong here, you know. Um, but, yeah. No, I do know, like, logically it is just a Pro Bowl, you know. Sure. So when COVID has kind of been fixed and all that, do you have plans to tour or play more live gigs? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we um, – I actually just finished recording a live album with the band two weekends ago. We're participating in, um, it, it was called the Arts Beats and Eats Festival. It's in Detroit. Um, I don't know what they changed it to, but they're doing like an online uh, festival. So we'll be playing in that. Um, I just actually, someone just reached out for another, uh, a solo show um, on another, you know, platform that's stream. So pretty much, yeah, we'll, that's that's definitely going to be you know, what we're doing now that we've got it. You know, now that we've got a that was the other reason I wanted to have a catalog together. We were technically supposed to start doing that this year, but, it, you know, it's whatever. Um, so, yeah, that's 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 definitely what we'll be doing, you know, playing live again and starting to go on tours and so forth. And I'm really excited about it. I just I'm really excited about it, but I'm not trying to rush it because I know, you know, I know how that goes when you try to, you know, push, push, push. And then. You know, I just – and when, I, when I'm talking about rushing it, I just mean as far as, like, the COVID thing goes, you know. Um, still want to be responsible and so forth. But when things are good, I'll, we'll be rocking and rolling. Cool. Well, two quick questions, and then you're free for me. And the first one, out of nowhere, Detroit guy. Did you see the show Detroiters on Comedy Central? And if so, is it funny? 
I've never seen it. I didn't even know that there was a show on. So I don't watch TV either. I know I'm really, it's really bad. I'm a really bad interviewee. Like, I, No way. You are your own guy. Do you know how refreshing it is to hear somebody who actually has opinions? Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Especially in sport. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. I, I, I don't know. I don't. I don't know how you do it. I don't know how anyone does it that works in sports. I couldn't do it like a long time, you know. Exactly. Well, the closing question. Okay. Uh, it can be advice. It can be just telling people to go to your website. My closing question is: Any last words for the kids? For the kids, um, There's so many th different things that just came to mind, so I just let them out. Um, sure. Don't let anybody tell you what you can't do. Not fitting in. No, no. this is what I want to tell the kids. No one's normal. We have this preconceived notion of what normality is and all that other kind of stuff, but deep down inside, none of us are normal. And anyone that would tell you that they are normal, tell them to tell you like everything that they're thinking about, all their deepest, darkest secrets, the things that they wouldn't tell anybody else. And you'll quickly realize no one's normal. Um, yeah. That's a song right there. If you've not put that in the song already, you got to. I will. You're right. I didn't <laughs> Well, Joe, I can't thank you enough for your time. I'm really glad to see the work that you're doing and doing so much of it. So thank you. I'm really excited. I'm, um, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to get the music out and get, you know, hear what people think about it and continue down this, down this path. And thank you so much for having me on your show too. My pleasure. I'll tag you when it's all out and up there, but just keep up the greatness you're doing. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Have a great weekend. You too now. Outrocast.